Good morning, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter, right? And this morning, we shall begin again with Ariel Henri. And yesterday, I came upon an article, and it was titled, I think this article came from Caribbean Life, and said, and it is titled, Henry told to keep promise to quit interim government almost there. So it means, as I told you before, that Henri has not yet resigned, right? Even though we have been hearing from the media that Henri did resign, but he did say until the transitional presidential council is created. Right. Um, what if that council or after that council has been created? What if Henri decides not to resign? Is this a game? That is a question that we should be asking ourselves. Because as we have been plagued with lies, lies upon lies, because that's how empires function. And the reigning empire is the United States that has decided that it needs to impose its imperial wings over Haiti and to ensure that the little children are safely taken to shore, right? Where they will be safe and they will have freedom and democracy. That is the official narrative coming from Washington and coming from almost all embassies around the world, including in Kingston, right? Or in Nairobi or in Port-au-Prince, wherever you are. That is the narrative that we're hearing. And many of you believe that narrative because you do not do your own research. You're not able to think and you are not rooted and grounded in truth. As a result of that, you take for granted and you take uncritically, you digest uncritically everything that the media tell you. Everything that, that comes from the Western media is to be accepted as the gospel of Christ, as thus saith the Lord of hosts. You won't even trust your Bibles. You don't even read your Bibles because you think it's something that is mythical, but you trust something that comes from inferior human beings, right? Who are going to be transformed into worms when death comes knocking at their door. But that is how you have been conditioned. And you think that you're intellectuals, you think that you're scholars without putting in the necessary research. Now, how can we speak robotically? All of us are saying the same thing. And yes, I agree that we have to come to some form of consensus. But yes, when we have freedom of expression and we are fast losing that particular freedom, the right to express yourself. Of course, within constraints, but if we're going to live in a democratic society, we've got to have contending narratives. Let the narratives contend. That is how we are going to be able to come to an understanding of what is true and what is spurious. And we've got to understand that. And the more you talk about these things, as the more people become very nonchalant and indifferent. You don't care because these are just some hapless black people in Haiti who are going to be killed and life goes on. Life goes on. Yesterday, I was listening to a program redacted um, that... Clayton and um, Natalie Morris, they are a couple, a United States couple, and they have a YouTube podcast um, in which they present the news every day. I mean, 
extremely intelligent um, minds, right? They do excellent investigative journalism. But yesterday, as I was watching Clayton, and he was discussing with his guest, Dan Cohen, and Dan Cohen is a journalist at the Mint Press, that's also an independent newspaper in the United States, an independent online news source, Mint Press. Dark news, and they present some very good news um, from a left-wing perspective. Now, he was, you know, in Haiti. I think he journeyed to Haiti because of what seemed to have happened to a um, YouTube vlogger that went to Haiti, and apparently he's uh, he's notorious. That vlogger is notorious for speaking with um, known criminals and getting interviews with them and then posting or uploading these things on YouTube. And he gets lots of followers for doing that because people are always attracted to criminality. For some reason, we have a, an ambivalent attitude. Human beings tend to have an ambivalent attitude to uh, what you call it, criminality. We have so sensitized our young minds, our young children, to watch Hollywood criminal films, films that portray criminality, that people like it. All right, the Rambo image and the fact that you know you have some guys who are killing, and that you have a hero, the person who kills the most is is a hero. We have been conditioned by Hollywood for years, and we don't even recognize that. But anyway, the, oh, the, 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 the guest on Redacted was speaking about Jimmy Cherizier and the fact that you know this particular blogger, and he's a US citizen who went to Haiti and seemed to have had contact with uh, Jimmy Cherizier and wanted to have interviewed him as a gang member because you know we are hearing lots of stories, lots of narratives coming out of Haiti, and the Western media is portraying this narrative that Jimmy Cherizier is a cannibal because you know white people or Europeans have always thought that blacks are cannibals when they perhaps are the <laughs> the most cannibalistic, um, you know, ethnic group that is perhaps on the face of the planet, right? Because some of the things that they did and they're still doing, you wonder if any human being can be that stupid and, and evil. You really wonder, yet. But that is the whole reality that the media houses, the Western media have been portraying or giving this narrative that Jimmy Cherizier is a cannibal and he has been eating people alive. Now, we can't vouch for that because I don't know Jimmy Cherizier. I hardly think that is true. In fact, I'm not sure if we have any cannibals in the Caribbean um, islands. Maybe we do, but I, I doubt. It. The fact of the matter is that the story, the narrative that Dan Cohen was carrying, I, I questioned it and I really respect Dan Cohen's work because he goes to Haiti frequently and he does his job, right, of investigation and investigating, going into very dangerous spots to do his investigation. One of the things I do not like about the redacted uh, reporting on Haiti is the fact that they have also taken sides. And it's very important that when you're, you know, you're reporting the news that you do not take sides. You give the facts and you leave your viewers to determine what they want to think. All right, The conclusion that they would want to make having given them the facts, the evidence, as much as you can. Because remember now that the facts are narratives also. The facts are not necessarily truth because they are just evidence that is corroborating whatever thesis that you have in your head, right? So let us see that I think that Jimmy Cherizier is a gang member. I could go to Haiti tomorrow and give you, you know, or present to you evidence that suggests that he is a criminal. If I want to depict Jimmy Cherizier as a hero, I could also go to Haiti and present you with the facts 
that Jimmy Cherizier is a hero by showing you pictures or images that I would like you to see that corroborate my understanding, my view of Jimmy Cherizier. So we've got to not take what we see on the media, the images that we see in the media as little truths, right? We can only say, oh, and we be, as we listen and as we look at more images, then we should be able to try to make some form of connection and not say that this is so. And this is what people do all the time. They tell you that they, this is what I saw. Do you know that even your own eyes, that you are, you cannot trust your own eyes because sometimes what you see is not what you get. And some people don't have the critical lens from which to analyze anything. They what they see is not is not definitely what they get or what they're getting, but they think so because they do not have the foundational way marks, the foundational uh, what should I say now ground. Right, or the principles, the foundational knowledge to be able to assess what they are literally seeing. Right now, for example, let me give you an example. You're looking at Haiti, and you are just looking at the images that you know that are coming from the media, and you see a country at war, a country that is chaotic all around, particularly in the in the large city of Port-au-Prince. And you might be wondering, why are Haitians fighting against themselves? And many Americans wonder that. Why are they fighting? Why don't they just get it together? Why can't they understand that Haiti is a beautiful island, and if they fix that island up, then tourists can go, and then they'll have a wonderful paradise. <laughs> That's how Americans think. That simplistic understanding of the world. Right? Not all, but most do because of a lack of education and a lack of understanding of how even the United States operates. Because if you don't understand how the US operates, then you won't understand what's going on in Haiti. Right? So it means, therefore, that US citizens have to elevate their understanding of the very country that they live in. All right? But the, the, the narrative that Dan Cohen gave on the redacted program yesterday is that, you know, this particular, this alleged American citizen went to Port-au-Prince and met with Cherizier and after which he was kidnapped, right? And then I think he, Dan Cohen, seemed to have called Jimmy Cherizier and somehow they worked out some way of... I'm not sure if he was kidnapped by Jimmy Cherizier. I think he might have been kidnapped by somebody else, right? But Jimmy Cherizier, having that sort of power that he wields in Haiti, was able to contact that particular gang member, and they were able to release him. That's my understanding. You know, in a, in a gist, that was the summation of what Dan Cole said. But he's mentioned something that Dan Cohen um, has not only been interviewed by that YouTuber, right? He has also been interviewed by lots of other mainstream media outlets like, you know, Reuter, Reuters and the BBCs and, and the journalists have traveled there to Haiti where they have interviewed him. And my question to to Clayton, because Clayton didn't ask that question. And he tends to ask hard questions because again, he's siding with Jimmy Cherizier that Jimmy Cherizier obviously is going to probably perhaps bring the Haitians freedom. Maybe Clayton is not probably suggesting that, but maybe he's siding with Jimmy Cherizier because Americans tend to look at everything black and white, right? So you have the good guys and the bad guys, the bad cops and the good cops. And our world does not function in that way, right? I would love if our world functioned in that way because you could easily assess things. But our world is much more complex and textured 
much more nuanced than Americans like to think because they just like to put things in the microwave and then it's heated and it's hot, ready to go, right? But the world is not like that, right? When it comes on to cultures, there's so many different forces contending within that one culture that we cannot divide them by saying here are the good cops and here are the bad cops. It just does not work that way. Right? There are people, for example, in the United States who suggest that, oh, let's disarm the entire population or disarm the gangs. And then the problem will be solved. It doesn't work like that also. Because let's say that the gangs are disarmed tomorrow, the entire population in Haiti, right, is disarmed tomorrow. Then who are you going to give the guns to? You're actually assuming that the people who are collecting the guns or who are doing the dis the, 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 the who are disarming the population are the good cops. But what if they are the bad cops? What if the people who are disarming the population and the gangs are a part of the problem? Then they are going to turn the arms on you and wreak entire havoc and destruction upon the entire population. So it's not that simple that you just go and disarm a population. And that is why the founding fathers of the United States, they actually included a second the, in the second amendment, the, the right to bear arm, because the right to bear arm is in case your government, not the people in it, in case the very government becomes corrupt, then the citizens can defend themselves. It is not about your neighbor, you know. It is the government, because they understood that when you lose your freedoms and the situation that is happening in Haiti is as a result of government adulterating their jobs and, you know, finding them themselves aligned with criminal elements that eventually dictatorship is going to be imposed upon the population, right? And in their times, the whole religious understanding of when the state also merges with religious elements and with religious institutions. And already we are seeing where that ground is being laid in the United States for church and state to be melded or to be welded together, right? We're seeing that already. That's happening already in the United States. So if that happens and dictatorship should come upon the United States, which it is going to come, which it is going to come by the way, you only have to read Revelation 13 and beyond and see that the United States is going to become, is going to speak like a dragon, and she has already started. So, right? This freedom and democracy. What is freedom and democracy in the eyes of the United States? Right? It, this is what you call imperialism and militarism. That is what you have to know. The United States is spreading imperialism and militarism which will eventually end up in dictatorship and the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives of innocent human beings. Because that's what is happening. But the larger population of the world have accepted that the United States is in fact diffusing freedom and democracy around the world. They believe that. Because you sit before your media every day and that is what they give you, a steady diet of lies and propaganda. But if Jimmy Cherizer, who is for some left-wing ideologists, because that's what they are, they're ideologists, is this sort of hero 
And he is this sort of uh, antagonist, right? Someone who is working against the interests of the US empire and other members of the core group and the United Nations. Why is it that he has been inviting and entertaining the mainstream media, journalists from the mainstream media, right? Such as Reuters. And these people, you know, we know who owns these people. Right? And that a lot of these media houses in the United States work for the military industrial complex, work for the US empire. So if they have a face-to-face -face interview with Jimmy Cherry there, don't you think that they would have betrayed him in terms of where he is? I mean, I'm sure that if he is really contesting and contending with US forces and is an enemy, number one, of the United States, how would he be able to have been interviewed by these journalists without them telling the US or other powers like UK, probably I'm not sure if he's been interviewed by the BBC or the Guardian newspaper, but wouldn't they have betrayed him? Wouldn't they have indicated to the authorities, the Western authorities, where this Jimmy, Jimmy Chirizier is, right? Would Jimmy Chirizier, as an intelligent man, want them in his space? I don't know. You know, you probably can ask a question. It is weird. It is weird. The entire story is bizarre, right? And I was listening, to, well, not listening, but, you know, after listening to the, um, to the news on, you know, that narrative that Dan Cohen uh, shared with Clayton on the redacted news program, I read some of the comments, right? And this responder, this this person who commented on after the program had been under the comment section of his YouTube account, excuse me, suggested that, you know, well, he, he, he asserted, he made the comment that the entire narrative sounds like a show. Right? And he's right. It's almost like it's a movie. We're watching a movie. <laughs> that will never end. Right? Because it is just this, you know, plot after different plots that, you know, are they're trying to, 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 to merge, but we can't make any sense of out of these plots, right? They they're not adding up. The plots are just not adding up. The narratives that we are hearing are just not adding up, <laughs> right? Because if Jimmy Cherry is there, is hosting journalists and they're coming into his space, you know, and they're working for the supposed, the alleged enemy, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Because, you know, all they would have to do is to secretively, secretly apprehend him. Create a situation where you pretend as if the journalist is not with anyone and then you simply arrest him. I don't know, but it, 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 with all the technologies that are available to the US empire, it befuddles the mind why he could not have been yet apprehended if you have these mainstream journalists who have traveled to Haiti and have already interviewed him. And perhaps some are still interviewing him. We do not know. Now, let's go back to the article. Um, let me see if I can share that article with you so that you can see what I am talking about. Right, so let's go here and share the article. Now we have, this is coming from Caribbean Life, as I suggested, as I told you before, Henry told to keep promise to quit. So it means therefore that he has not yet resigned. 
And this is what's posted on April 1st, 2024. Well, maybe we can say it's April's full day, right? So are they fooling us? <laughs> but I don't think so. Because he did say that he would resign when that presidential council is uh, formulated, when it is created. Now, with, with a nine-member interim government set to take its place as early as this week in Haiti, training and planning preparations for international security force to stabilize the country's deteriorating security situation are being stepped up with Jamaica as the base officials said this week. So Jamaica has taken on this mess. And when I read this piece of information, I thought, wow, Jamaica. Why have you decided to take on this mess? And I'm not suggesting here that we should not defend as fellow Caribbean citizens the interests of all Haitians because what happens in Haiti, in Haiti make no bones about, will have direct impact on neighboring Caribbean territories. It will have, just logical. Right? It is just logical to understand that it's going to have catastrophic influences. And even on southern states in the United States, like 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 Florida, it's going to have catastrophic effects. Right? So this is nothing that we are seeing that is an ordinary thing and we should. And we're not only talking about also insecurity, physical insecurity. But we're talking about the institution, the democratic institutions of government, of Western governments. It's going to have a ripple effect because if citizens, if the civil society doesn't like a particular government that is in office and they want to boot him out of office, him or her out of office, then if that government is pro-US empire and does everything the US wants him or her to do, then they, got, then they can call on armies, on mercenary armies or soldiers from any part of the world to come and to squash any uprising in your country, right? And that is something that we have to be wary of. And we have to keep at the forefront of our minds. It's interesting to note also that yesterday, after I'd watched the program redacted, that one of the comments, the, 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 uh, the followers, one of his subscribers also wrote after the video, in, and she mentioned, she said that oftentimes U.S. citizens, when they look on Haiti, what is happening on the ground, she wonders if these portend, all the issues portend to what will happen in US cities in the future. And she is right. And I have been saying that on this channel for some time now, that what is happening in Haiti will happen, right? In larger cities of the world in years to come. And I think that we are closer to that happening everywhere, right? And it's not just about what is happening in Haiti. This war is about freedom versus enslavement. Do you want to be free? Do you want to have your voice? Do you want to be the ones who send your politicians to parliament or to Congress? Or are they our overlords? and our slave masters who wield their powers over us and like citizens, like robots, we listen to their diktats and follow them. And I think that is the, the scenario. That is the situation that, over which rather, I say that is the situation over which um, the war is being waged. That is something 
that we've got to understand. But let's go back to, you know, to Jamaica. And I wonder if Jamaica is making some contributions to this war. We know that the Canadians have given $90 million. The United States seem, seem to have said it's 200 million, 300 million. We don't know, even though we're hearing reports that the Kenyans did get 600 million and uh, for their forces to be deployed to Haiti. That's a lot of money, right? Um, so we don't know if Jamaica is getting money to do this training or they are actually taking it from the economic purse of the nation. We don't know. And Jamaicans are not asking that question. And other things I would like to ask Jamaica, the government of Jamaica, right, is when you send these Jamaican troops to Haiti, and I do not think I have to ask that question, it is not a matter of if, it is when they're either killed or maimed for life. Who is going to take care of them if they're maimed? Well, if they die, they will have to be buried, right? But if they are seriously injured for life, different disabilities, mental disabilities, physical disabilities, who is going to take care of them? Will the government take care of them? What are the facilities in place in terms of health care to take care of these maimed and injured soldiers when they shall have returned to the country? Right? I think that these are questions that the journalists should be asking the government of Jamaica. Right? These are questions that the, 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 the journalists, one of the things that I also, that, that really struck me when I read about the fact that Jamaica is actually coordinating these uh, military undertakings, I wondered for a moment, I really wondered for a moment, if we have forgotten history, I really wonder, it struck me, have we as a people forgotten our history of exploitation? And what is the role of the university or the universities in Jamaica in empowering, and not only universities, but the high schools, empowering its citizens about the history and the, the connections of that history, the applications of the history that we have studied. I do wonder, I really do wonder. Another thing, what were, you know, was the, um, were, I should say, were the Jamaican people consulted about this joint military endeavor before, you know, we just got up on Sunday and the Jamaica Observer and Gleaner, you know, were screaming these headlines from their papers, right? That Jamaica is going to be participating. Uh, they will be acting as the training ground for the military deployment of the multinational security forces to Haiti. Were the people of Jamaica consulted before the government, the Jamaican government, made that decision? I am not sure. And shouldn't they be consulted? And shouldn't they give their opinions? I'm sure they're, you know, they're calling in. They're having, you know, Jamaicans like to talk, so they have their different talk show hosts there, and I'm sure people are expressing themselves and asking. Why? Why are we participating in this military endeavor when our country is also collapsing, teetering on the brink of collapse, a total collapse, because we also have gangs. And I think the next video that I make, I will expound on the connection between the Haitian and Jamaican gangs.
And I think Haiti has over, what, 300 or 400 gangs, we were told. And Jamaica has way over 250 gangs, 246 thereabout, for a small island, much smaller than Haiti. So we have a serious problem in Jamaica with criminality and this gang violence. Deeply embedded in our culture, a violent culture because of what happened during slavery and colonialism. And the wrongs have not yet been righted. And we came upon a situation in, in 2010 where the gangs literally, well, well, a particular gang of which Douglas was the leader, literally contested the power of the state because the state has not provided or was not providing for the needs of that particular constituency. It was more mostly the, the Don, which at the time was Christopher the Scope. And by the way, when these criminals or these Dons, as they call them in Jamaica, are apprehended and they are extradited to the United States or to wherever. They are replaced by other gang members, by other dons, and the cycle continues. And the cycle continues. Right? And every time we add a band aid to the wound, and the sore gets deeper and deeper and becomes much more damaged. Right? That's what is happening. But I would like to ask a question. I do not think the Jamaican people were consulted. I do not think that they gave the Jamaican parliament the wherewithal and their full consent to participate in this military endeavor in Haiti. I do not think so, because I think most Jamaicans are crying out for the government to solve the crime problem there. They are crying out for the government of the day to solve that problem. And yet still, we're taking on criminal elements in another country. We don't know how to deal with criminal elements in our country. And the U.S. has been so you know helping for all these years. But again, where are the guns coming from? Right? Where are the guns coming from? That is the question. But yet we are getting all of this aid every year, and the US and Jamaican, Jamaican guards, you know, they're the Coast Guards are constantly working with each other to solve this problem of crime and violence. And the more money that is invested into solving this monster of crime it's the more that it increases. And the people are not making the connection. They are not making the connection. And if you look at what is happening in your health industry, in education also, the more money or the more monies that are invested in these two sectors, it's the more uneducated the populace is. It's the more unhealthy the populace is. Right? Hundreds of thousands of dollars. And some of you still sit down and look at what the government is saying about the quantities of money that they are investing in sectors like education and, and healthcare. And you say, wow, yeah, great, right, great. But where is that money going? Into the pockets of bureaucrats and not in developing an effective healthcare and education sector, right? And that's what you have to understand. You've got to make the connections and it is just mind boggling, I must say, when I look at how stupid many of us are. I am, I am really mind blown, right? 
Now, let's look at, let's continue with that article because some things are very important for us to understand. The Jamaican Defense Force officials announced this week that they are partnering with Canada on a readiness exercise ahead of an imminent deployment to Haiti alongside forces from other Caribbean nations, Kenya, Benin, and other countries around the world which have offered to participate in the security civilization exercise. Now, I understand that the United States didn't want to do it, right? Well, they are enmeshed also in other wars. Canada refused to have done it, right? They did not want to do it. So what they did now, they went to some hapless poor Black countries and they worked with these elites, with these local elites, to get these soldiers to participate. Because at the end of the day, these are people coming mostly from working class, from the working class um, uh, members of society from the working class echelon. And uh, they are not going to be missed, if you will, right? They are just some poor hapless creatures on planet Earth and they can be considered as collateral damage, right? Now, this initiative will see service personals from the JDF, Jamaica Conservative Force, and this is what I that struck me. I understand that the Jamaica Defense Force, these are soldiers. They are trained soldiers. But my understanding is that Jamaica Constabulary Force are police. They're, these are police officers who do not have the training uh, that the personnel coming from the Jamaica Defense Force have. Now, why are they being involved when we don't even have sufficient police on the island of Jamaica, right? So what's gonna to happen to Jamaica when they leave? What's gonna to happen to us and our crime and violence? What happens if the crime and violence in Haiti, when they get there, spills over into Jamaica and chaos reigns there? Who is going to take care of us? Because one of the things that we know about the US is that they have no allies, they have interests, and they will use and spit you out of their mouths. They have no problems doing that. They even do that to their own people. So why are we getting ourselves involved in something that we know we're not fighting in the interest of Jamaicans? You know, I did tell you this story before that during the Civil War, you know, we, the U.S. Civil War, that is, the soldiers in the South who were made up initially, you know, of white soldiers. They were white soldiers because the Southerners, even the Northerners uh, at the beginning of the war didn't want to include blacks because it, of course, they thought that blacks were inferior, couldn't fight a war, and they just didn't want black people to know that the war was about them, that the war was being fought over slavery. That is one of the main reasons why they decided that they would not have incorporated or included blacks in the in, in in the struggle over who is going to be the boss, who is going to be a stronger arm, right? Now, when the after the whites who were largely working class whites, right, who fought in the Civil War in the South, right, when they saw that you know these people, most of them were just working class, and that they were just they're being used and abused. And that the elites didn't care. They just wanted to win the war. They didn't care who, how it was won, <laughs> right? They just wanted to win the war. And the Southerners, if you knew them, they were behaved like they were British. And they had this sort of elitism, this air, that they were not even Americans. They were British, right? So they're looking at some hapless white soldiers fighting for the South. But the working class white Americans, give them their credit, knew that they were being used. And afterwards, they stopped. They said, we're not going to fight any more wars for these people who had us practically under slavery too. Because remember now that the whites did not live any elevated life during slavery in the South. They were just a little bit, a little notch, right? A, a notch higher than the chattel slavery or the chattel slaves in the South. So when they saw what was happening after they had analyzed the conditions, and I'm sure they heard 
things coming from their masters' mouths that they realized, they said, you know, we're not going to fight anymore because these people are using us, right? And if they win, they're not going to give us any freedom. They're not going to exalt us and elevate our standard of living. They weren't even educated. They didn't even have schools, sufficient schools in the South, right? They were really some dirty white people, right? Muddy, dirty people, uneducated, illiterates, semi-literates, Right? And they could have picked up that and they realized that they were not fighting in the interest of the common man, but they were fighting in the interest of the Southern elites. And they stopped. The Southerners had to, they had no other choice but recruit Blacks to fight. <laughs> and I won't get into what happened when they recruited the Blacks. But the fact of the matter is, that they recognized that the war was not being fought in the interest of Southerners. All wars, as a matter of fact, are not fought in your interest, right? They are always fought. If you read history well, if you're intelligent if enough, if you have the critical lens that you ought to have, which many of you don't have, you will understand that wars are fought in the interest of the elites, not in the interest of the middle or working class people of the world, right? You've got to understand that. And I think if we understand that fact, we oftentimes would do, do more questioning and more resistance. We would enact more resistance against these wars. But we have, you know, believed the mainstream narrative. And hence, wars continue to be waged at our peril, right? At our peril. And lives have, innocent lives have been wasted because of men's greed. Because that was what it was all about. The United States did not have to go to a civil war if men were not greedy. Because Abraham Lincoln, as I told you, was not anti-slavery. He was just anti the expansion of slavery. As the US began to, you know, to expand the physical landmass of the country. They wanted to have slavery. And Abraham Lincoln said, how can we fill all of these new lands, right? These recently conquered lands and territories with slaves. It's not going to work. It's going to eventually lead into an entire country of slaves, right? And he did not agree with that. But he, if he had control, if the slave masters in the South had listened to Abraham Lincoln, he would have protected and he wanted to protect slavery in the South, right? But he did not want to expand it to the Western, the Midwestern part of the United States, right? So this is what we need to understand. The wars that are being waged, the current war in Haiti, it is a war because the United States has already occupied. It's been there since, you know, 1950, never left. One of the things that you need to understand is that when the United States invades a country, it never leaves. It, most of the officers might leave, but the control is still there. And it sets the stage for another one. And that is why Haiti has always been invaded, has been invaded at least since the 20th century, maybe four or five times, right? Because fact is how imperialism works. Fact is how militarism functions, right? And you've got to understand it. Now, let's go on with this article. I have to make connections because what we are seeing today is that people are not able to make connections, you know, and even Sir Ronald Sanders, a brilliant man, brilliant man, Right? He came on the program on Sunday and he shared 
his understanding, his perspective of what is happening in Haiti. But one of the things that I've always observed about these diplomats and these intellectuals and Professor um, Sir Ronald Sanders is indeed an, an intellectual, you know, by world standards. And, you know, it's a whole fact. What I've understood, what I've observed is the fact that they will come and they lecture you on what happens in history, right? So he done excellent summation of what the, the revolution, the Haitian revolution stood for, and he could narrate with accuracy and with deep understanding the events surrounding the Haitian revolution. What Sir Sanders failed to have done, God bless his soul, was to connect what is happening presently to who or with the revolution. He didn't say, you know, U.S. imperialism and the U.S. has, but there are deeper aspects that he should have unveiled. But then again, he said that he was not knowledgeable of what happened in 2004 during the coup that ousted the uh, former president of Katie John Bertrand Aristide. And with all the news going around, and that story is repeated ad nauseum, even in the mainstream media, how could Sir Sanders not know about, not have, I'm not saying now that he's going to be an expert on what happened during the coup. But I'm sure, as someone who is an ambassador, that he should have read something about that. In fact, you know, we learned that the plane that took Aristide from Haiti to, to Central Africa, it landed in Antigua before it moved on to Africa. Right, so it landed in. You know, I'm not. I think Sir Ronders. Where was he born? Was he born in Guyana and raised up and raised in in Antigua? I'm not sure. But the fact of the matter is that Sir Saunders should have some knowledge about what took place in 2004, what happened in 2010, right, with the election or selection, we should we say, of Michel Martelly and his shenanigans and acts of corruption. And he worked this Martelly government because he was so corrupt, worked closely with these corrupt elites, these corrupt political and economic elites of which Ronald himself spoke stri um, stridently against, right? He's, he did say that, you know, one of the reasons why CARICOM has decided to assist in this deployment of foreign soldiers in to Haiti is the fact that the, the, the leaders of the Caribbean con um, countries, the leaders of CARICOM, respect and love the Haitian people. <laughs> but they do not find the elites to be people who are noble and men and women of integrity. In essence, that's what he said. But the elites have always worked with the United States. So how is it? that they're going to have a joint effort working with the Haitian elites, along with US elites, French elites, Canadian elites, all of these elites, and yet they're working for the interest or in the interest of the common man. It's not logical, it doesn't make any sense, right? Make that make sense, because it doesn't make any sense to me. And if it doesn't make any sense, I am going to throw it outside. <laughs> I'm going to throw it outside of my brain. I have too many other issues to worry about, to think about, than to think about something that doesn't make any sense. Bye. No longer in my mind. Okay? Doesn't make any sense. Now, let's continue with the piece of article here to see if we can glean any further 
insights into what is happening. So we have Canada has already ordered to donate close to 100 million to the force, while the US says it will pledge $300 million. Other regional countries which have pledged to have boots on the ground include Suriname and Barbados, while Guyana has hinted that it may provide cash to the effort. It may, but it's not certain. Now, this is the Prime Minister of Guyana and also the current chairman of CARICOM, Dr. Um, Irfan Ali, right? This is the guy, and he may, he's not sure, right? Even though he's now an oil-rich country, as it were, well, right? But he may, and I agree with him, why dedicate funds to an effort that you know will not be of any help to the Guyanese people? The heightened preparations come as regional leaders have written to outgoing Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry, reminding them that he needs to keep his promise to step aside once a new interim government is fully in place and ready to function. The letter was sent at the weekend by regional bloc chair and Guyanese President Orphan Ali to Henry at his temporary exile spot in Puerto Rico. The leaders also urged him to take the necessary steps to liaise with the council as they push to get government in place in collaboration with council members and other stakeholders. So it has been confirmed the president has not fully resigned or shall we say the prime minister, right? He is just there in limbo. And who to tell we're living in the days, right, in our current society of working from home, right? <laughs> you know, what if Ariel Henry is in Puerto Rico working from home, right? Working, having a government that is not physically there, but works from home. Are they also testing the, the waters in terms of that will eventually happen where we can have our governments in Port of Spain and, you know, a, a Jamaican government working from Port of Spain, right? Or working from Antigua or where, whatever, you know, wherever, from Miami, if you will. Is that what the future portends? You know, something we need to ask ourselves because we are not sure what's happening. You know, we are just reading and we're just trying to compile the facts. But the facts, remember, are not necessarily truth. You have to put the pieces together, the factual information together to arrive at an understanding of the truth. What we want are different narratives. And as we read as many narratives as possible, then we begin to connect the dots to see where the dots are more consistent and to see, to see if they fit into a whole piece. Right? It's just not to sit there and say, yes, I saw this, and that's what they say. And it is true. It is not necessarily true. And even if they provide you with empirical evidence, it doesn't mean that it's true. Right? Because even the empirical evidence has to be tested, has to be proven, has to be vetted. And one of the things that I fear in our society today, people look at these computerized models or models, and they think that, wow, look at the stats, it looks perfect. When <laughs> these are just made up empirical evidence, right? Because it's easy to do it. The technology now we have, these technologies, you just put things, you just put in some numbers, and the computer makes up these wonderful, beautiful graphs, the bar charts, right? And you look at them and you say, wow, phenomenal. And it's a bunch of garbage, right? It's a bunch of garbage. But you believe it because guess what? It's empirical evidence, right? <laughs> right? And I am not against empirical evidence. What I'm against is an adulterated version of empirical evidence which for the most part, that's what we're getting 
in our modern society because we can't distinguish between real and unreal right now. So that's what is happening, gentle folks. I hope that you are looking at what is happening in the media. Now, this, this is a critical and urgent first step to allow the council to commence functioning and to initiate the accelerated deployment of a multilateral security support mission authorized by the UN security. The MSS is intended to support the Haitian National Police in bringing the country to a situation of security and stability for the holding of free and fair general elections. I mean, they have been calling for these, this, these free and fair elections from the president died from Moise was assassinated and it has not yet been held. To pave the way for long recovery, growth and development of Haiti, CARICOM will revert to you once the name of the interim prime minister is known. The council has a single female representative and that has to be known because you have to talk about gender equality. I wonder if they're also recruiting female soldiers to fight in this war because it is about gender equality. And I do wonder if females are also a part of that deployment and they will be on the grounds. You know, we should inquire about that, but because shouldn't we be concerned about gender equality? That's equity, right? It's liberty and equality, fraternity, <laughs> right? Everything has to be equal then. Men and women can do everything. There's nothing that men can do that women can't do and nothing that women can do that men can't do. That is the world that we live in at the current moment, right? A world filled with people with delusional minds. Right? And this delusional thinking comes from the theories that we learn in the universities or at these hollowed walls of higher education. And I was a part of that institution. So you can't tell me anything about it. You can't tell me anything about it. I am knowledgeable of the system and that it is a system that really is about building egos as opposed to building well-rounded people who understand the role and the mission, mission rather, of being citizens of high integrity. It's all about the show, making money and to be associating yourselves with people whom you deem to be important. Right? It's not about thinking. It's not about thinking. And I'm not suggesting that there are people who go to the universities and are, and are not thinking people. Some of them are thinking people because the university did not teach them how to think. They went there being thinking persons and they left there as thinking persons. Unfortunately, some also leave there having gotten there as thinking persons, left there indoctrinated, but not all are indoctrinated. And some went there also as non-thinking persons and came out as thinking persons. So it depends on you and the sort of objective you have for educating yourself, right? When I was at university, for example, I most of the textbooks that the that were prescribed by these professors. I went through them like, they were, I, I didn't find them for the most part. A few of them I might have found interesting. I went, for example, to the University of Maryland College Park, bless their heart, where they had a lot, a diversity of books in their bookstore. And I went and I purchased books. And I went to other bookstores in, um, Silver Spring, Maryland, and I would sit during my summer holidays and read books, read good books, so that I could expand my understanding of the world. Because if I were to depend on the university to, to on the university to, ex, to have expanded my understanding of the world, I would have left there void. 
and a dance. But one of the primary things also that gave me that understanding of what is happening in current events and current affairs is uh, the teaching of the Bible, the teachings rather, I should say, of the Bible, particularly the books of Daniel and the Revelation, the prophetic teachings of the Bible. You just see that because God gives you a sweeping, a broad sweep of history and what is going to portend in the future, what's going to happen in the future, right? And once you have that, all you're able to do is to put the the oranges and the mangoes into the basket. The basket's already there. The foundation has been laid by God. So you need now to put the pieces together, right? Right? God knew what the animals and all the creatures and the plants were to be named when Adam was created, but he gave Adam that duty to name them. But God knew their names already. He knew what was going to be called the elephant and the lion and the different types of birds and all the different species of animals. He knew. But he gave Adam that elevated task to study them and then to name them to use the brain that God had made. So those of you who think that religion is just about sitting on clouds, and <laughs> that's nonsense, right? Because the very fact that after Adam was created, he had to name, he was given the task of naming and giving scientific names to these creatures, right? It means that God is a serious educator and that he requires thinking students because God was their teacher in the Garden of Eden. And they were just not only learning about him, but they also were learning about his creation. And that's what we do when we study science and we study anything that we study. We are learning about God's creation. Right? But that is another topic. I just wanted to bring you here about the, the, the understanding of what we need to do to educate ourselves, which I find to be a problem in our society today. Now, we talk about, so CARICOM, what do they say here? For over the weekend as well, CARICOM has sent a number of other legal documents to Katie, including an order for the formal nomination of council members and a decree, and a decree, right? I don't like this word and a decree that would provide for its functioning. Is this how democracies work now, by decree? Right? Is this how democracy works? It also listed the names of the nominees or delegates who will eventually form part of an interim cabinet. Regional officials are clearly hoping that a local judge will be able to swear in the members as early as this week as the security situation continues to deteriorate. Every week, the security is deteriorating and nothing is happening. The gangs continue unabated and they continue to rule a small territory that would be easy for the U.S. to send some military guys to apprehend. They have the technologies, right? They have the technologies to do so. Instead, what we're going to have, just like we had in Tivoli Gardens in 2010 in Jamaica, where there was a joint military effort, and they went there and they killed some hapless poor Black people. Right? The same thing is going to happen in Haiti. They're just going to go there and boom, boom, boom. And they kill some forest, poor, impoverished, hapless black people. And the sad thing about it, other black people around the world, people in the African diaspora are just chatting. Right? They don't care about the truth. They're just chatting about African philosophy. Right, and we were kings and queens in Africa, right? And we are living under deplorable conditions in the West for the most part, living a life 
that nobody cares about us, right? And we go to universities and they talk a lot of nonsense. And we come out, you know, again, void, not knowing who we are as a people. Because if Haiti had developed its economy, and I still challenge Sir, San Sir, Sanders, Sir Ronald Sanders, if Haiti's economy was robust, the United States would not be going there in the way it's, it's going there right now. At least it would have had a challenge. I'm not saying it probably wouldn't go there, but it would have had a challenge. And it would have to rethink its position. Haiti would not be in the, in the media um, being described as the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. Fact is intentional, ladies and gentlemen. Fact is deliberate. Right? And they are using that expression, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, so that the United States and the poor group and the United Nations, Sir Saunders, I beg your pardon, I have to say, and the United Nations, because the United Nations have been there since 2004, or is it 2007, they're about, right? But we know that they left in 2017, 18, they're about, right? They've been there, and the, the problem has not improved, because it wasn't Minusta, right? Minusta, that, that, um, soldiers that were deployed to Haiti, they were under the auspices of the United Nations, right? They were sent under the auspices of the United Nations. So the United Nations has also blood on its hands for the way in which it has treated the Haitian people, right? But I just wanted to show you that CARICOM, you know, um, right now we don't even know if Leah Martley, the Barbadian Prime Minister, is really the true leader of CARICOM. It seems that she is. or And it seems that there is some division between she and, and Andrew Holness of Jamaica trying to fight for who is the best slave to work for the slave masters. That's what is happening. Right? You have these two house slaves competing at the table of their slave masters. And the Caribbean people, including the so-called intellectuals, are sitting comfortable in their seats, not saying anything until the troops show up at your front door. And what will thou say when the troops show up at your front door. And they're not there to greet you. They're there to plunder and to pillage and to destroy. What will thou say, my dearest scholars of the Caribbean? What will thou say? Thank you so much for joining. It has been a pleasure of mine to share my thoughts with you. Please remember to like, and to share and to subscribe so that this information, this channel, this thinking channel can be diffused to as many people as possible on this platform all around the world. Thank you for joining. All the best. Adios.